for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday evening, June the 24th, 1982. Summer family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Frank Hammond is the speaker of the evening. Aren't you thankful for a camp opportunity like this? Thankful to the Lord for such a provision? Because it's truly true that there are very few opportunities like this around the country. I've crisscrossed the country many times in ministry. But there are few opportunities today where there are a camp situation where you can come together and get concentrated ministry over a span of days. And it's heartening to know how many ministers and church leaders are having the opportunity to come into places like this to get deliverance and to learn more themselves about the ministry of deliverance. You know, we've seen that this is one way to accelerate the ministry of deliverance. When you get the pastors involved in it, you get the whole church involved in it. Praise the Lord. And it's, uh, it's something that God is doing. I believe that He is hastening the preparation of the bride. And we know that more and more churches. When we first started out, uh, there were not too many churches that were really open and understanding about the ministry of deliverance. There are still pockets of resistance around, but the Lord's breaking that down. And more and more are coming in to realize that they've got to have it. Uh, it can't be done without deliverance. It's just a part of the total ministry that Jesus wants his church involved in. He said we were to do what he did. We can't improve on his formula. And he went out, he preached the gospel, he taught, he ministered healing, he ministered deliverance. All that the people needed, Jesus brought forth. And we have the same ministry that he had. Of course, the deliverance ministry is the garbage detail in the work of God. It's getting rid of all the rubbish and garbage. And But I'm thankful to have a part on God's garbage truck. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. It's a, it's a rewarding ministry. So God it just moves there. We never know where the fruit of our labors are going to end up. Just like you who are here, here, you will take what you have received in many different directions. And the waves of blessing will just move on and on and on. Now, I want to continue tonight sharing with you in the vein that we've been sharing in some of the other services. What we're really doing, we're on a uh, warfare mission, you know, where they send out a squad once in a while that their mission is to search out and to destroy. They search out the enemy and then destroy the enemy. And we're on a search ministry this week as we search out the enemy where he has infiltrated the ranks where he has come in into our own lives so that we can know where he is and what he's doing for the purpose of getting rid of the enemy and destroying the works of the enemy. The approach that the Lord has given me for these uh, services is is different than I have ever ministered before, and I'm enjoying the refreshing approach to, uh, to the ministry of deliverance. As I was ministering a while and in a group deliverance up in Pennsylvania, the Lord gave me the format of this as I delivered the people. He, he said to minister the people for breaking the chains of bondage off of the total man, off of the soulish man, off of the physical body, and off of the spirit man. And so God just began to give me discernment in those particular areas. And then after I got back home for these past three weeks, I've gotten to be back in my church for the first time in three months. And uh, I enjoyed some fresh Bible study and getting in and preparing the things that I've been sharing with you this week. Now, we have covered some of the bases as we have dealt with breaking the bondages and chains of darkness off of the soulish area. We've dealt with the matter of the mind and breaking the chains off of our mind and also off of our emotions. Now, there's one area of the soulish man that I pray that we'll eventually be able to get through in this conference, and that is breaking the bonds off of the will, which is another function of the soulish man. And tomorrow, the Lord willing and leading, Adam and I together would like to share with you concerning the need to deal with the chains of bondage that are upon the physical man. Because as we've seen, the body, soul, and spirit function together. And the spirit man has to be king 
over the soul and the body. If we, if we don't have it that way, then we have problems. We, we are in a, a spiritual drought that we need to be delivered from. So God is showing us how that all of these areas are to be set free. You see, when we were saved, when we were born again, we experienced a new birth, and God's Spirit came to take residence in our spirit. And our spirit, which was dead, was made alive by the quickening of God's Holy Spirit. And then after that, most of us have received, I think about 20 people last night, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit here. And that means that when you receive the baptism, you're not only alive, but you're also empowered. And you are empowered to do the work of God. It says in Galatians 5 that if you live in the Spirit, you should walk in the Spirit. We ought to walk in the Spirit. We ought to be uh, led by the Spirit of God in everything we do. Saints, I appeal to you to press on, to press on in the work of God and what God has made available to us. So many believers in this day and time are living substandard spiritual lives. There is so much potential that we have not come into. There is so much spiritual inheritance that we have not ever received. You know, Israel was given a vast inheritance. And they really went into warfare and they took a large part of it. But if you study the scriptural reference, they never have yet come in to the full boundaries of their inheritance that God promised to Abraham. Of course, that is still in the working and is to be done before the return of the Lord. But the same principle is true. God has marked out a vast inheritance. Jesus died to provide a wonderful spiritual inheritance for us, something that embraces the whole being. Paul expressed it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 20. Let's read verse 22. He says, Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or completely, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. That's First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 22, 23, and 24. God wants you to be, to be preserved blameless. He wants your whole body, spirit, soul, your total being preserved in the ways of the Lord until the coming of the Lord. God has that goal for you as an individual as well as for the total body of Christ. So we press on in that battle to get victory in our body, soul, and spirit man. If the soulish man is leading, then all you have is a soulish Christian. He's doing things by his mind and his emotions. If you have a man that is controlled by his physical appetites and the desires of the flesh, you have a carnal Christian. And neither one of them are living fully to the glory of God. It's the spiritual man that's living for the glory of God. Everything that he does, everything that his body is involved in, he knows that his body is a member of even the very body of Christ. He is identified with the Lord. He knows that his body was purchased by the blood of Jesus. It really doesn't belong to him to do with it what he wants to. And so his body cooperates with the Holy Spirit and the spirit man that is in him. And his body is for the glory of God. As Paul says, glorify God in your body, which is his. So God's not only interested in our spirit man so that we will go to heaven when we die, but he has a purpose for us here on life, in this life. And that purpose cannot be fulfilled until we are serving him, body, soul, and spirit. The spirit man leading in that way. Now, will you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's look at a few verses here to help us appreciate the, the value of what God has made available to us by quickening our spirit and making us spirit men. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse 12. He says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. What's the name of that spirit which is from God? The Holy Spirit. He said, you haven't received a spirit of the world, but you've received the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that we might know. Now, he's going to tell you some of the benefits that come to you because you have 
the quickening and the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit, that you might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Through the Holy Spirit, we have access to a knowledge that the world does not have access to. The world is intent upon gaining knowledge. The whole philosophy, which is really a religion of humanism, says that man is the answer to all of his needs, that man is increasing so rapidly in knowledge and in understanding of the material world that he is going to be his own savior and deliver mankind out of all of his many problems and dilemmas. That's just another one of the big fat lies of the devil. There is knowledge that is of the world, but there is a knowledge that is of God, which is the superior knowledge, and only we who walk by the Spirit of God will understand the things of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul says, as I impart to you, I cannot even use the vehicles of man's wisdom to convey to you the truth that is in God. I have to use the very resources of God and His Spirit. Verse 14, but the natural man, that is the unspiritual man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. A man who is unspiritual, a man from the world, walk in a meeting like this, and he said, what a bunch of idiots sitting around involved in something like that when they could be out there having a good time. See, he doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God, and they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. See, we have the opportunity to understand and know things in the spirit realm. See, you can't experience the things in the natural realm without being born into the natural realm. When you're born into the natural realm, through your physical senses, you're able to explore and understand and appreciate the natural order of things. But you can't understand the things of the spirit realm. It's a whole different kingdom. It's a whole different realm. And the only way that you can begin to explore that realm is to be born into it, just like you were born into this natural life. And when you're born of the Spirit of God, you are born into the spirit realm, and then you are made alive and quickened that you may perceive and that you may appreciate the things that are in the spirit realm. So we have such tremendous potential in the Lord for growth and development. But he that is spiritual judgeth or discerneth all things, yet he himself is judged are discerned of no man. The man who is spiritual, he has an insight into everything that's taking place. You know, the carnal man, the natural man out there, he's sitting out there trying to figure out, well, what in the world is going on? And, you know, he's trying to diagnose everything. But as we walk in the spirit realm, as we see the operations of God's Holy Spirit and His angels, as we see the operation of evil spirits and all that they're doing and the warfare that's going on in the spirit realm, we come in to an understanding of what is going on on planet Earth. I mean, you know, we're not in the dark. We're not children of the dark. We're not children of the night. But we're walking in light. We have spiritual understanding. We have spiritual perception. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that blessed that we have that privilege? And so we can discern all of this, but other people can't figure us out. They look at us and they scratch our head and they're on the outside looking at us and say, boy, those bunch of cooks. I just can't figure them out at all. Well, God's that's what he said. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Praise his name. Now, as we talk tonight, I want to go on into the area of the spirit man and the need for the deliverance of the oppressions that move in upon the spirit man and the discipline of that spirit man within us. Now, we come back to that old dirty word, discipline. Everything about our spiritual lives require diligent, persistent discipline. Unless we are disciplined, we will never be able to go on into our full inheritance and to really appropriate all the blessings that Jesus Christ died that we might have when he went to the cross. So as we begin to discipline the, the uh, spirit man, we find that we have to begin 
to mature the spirit man. Because we learn that when the spirit man in us is formed, it is as a baby. It's described as a new birth. Well, when something is first born, it's a baby, isn't it? But it has potential, doesn't it? It has the potential to grow and to develop into spiritual maturity. And so when we are born again, we are born as babes in the Lord. Now, it is through a process of spiritual discipline that the spirit being in you begins to mature. It begins to be developed. Just like the natural body goes through a growth process where there is the necessary food and there is the necessary exercise for that physical body to grow and to develop and come to maturity. The same process has to take place in the spirit man. The spirit man has to be fed if he is going to grow unto maturity. Now, Jesus himself was born as a babe. He came and took on the likeness of man, and God came incarnate in the flesh when Jesus was born of Mary there in Bethlehem. Now, an interesting thing is said about Jesus in the glimpse that we see of him when he was 12 years of age. And it says that he grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. See, every part of his being had to develop. It had to grow. It had to come to maturity. He grew in stature. That means he grew up physically. He grew in wisdom. He grew in favor. He grew in favor with God. Now, as it talks about the different ways that Jesus grew, really what it's saying to us is what we're seeking to emphasize here, that we must grow and develop in body, soul, and spirit. Maybe some of us have had the idea, you know, that because Jesus was born as the Son of God, that there was no struggle process with Him, that there was no need, everything was just, you know, poured into Him and put into Him, and, you know, He was just complete as it was and didn't have to go through a growth process. But it says even in the book of Hebrews that He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus grew because he was a disciplined person. He gave himself to the study of the Word of God. At the age of 12, he could amaze and astound the learned doctors there in the temple because as a child, he had given himself. He wasn't out in vain imaginations. If he had been out, you know, doing a lot of the things that our kids are doing today, he would never have grown up in the wisdom and the knowledge of the things of God. I tell you, that's the reason I say God wants our children delivered from a lot of fantasies and brought into the realities. The Scripture says in Deuteronomy 6 that we need to keep the children in the Word of God from the time they wake up in the morning until they go to bed at night. When they wake up, when they're walking by the way, when they're sitting in the house, the application of the Word of God needs to be made in their life because that's what's going to grow them up and mature them in spiritual manhood. Now, as the spirit man is fed... It says in 1 Peter 2, 2, As a newborn babe, desire the sincere or the unadulterated milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So the first discipline of the spirit man is to see that your spirit man is fed. And the thing that he feeds on is the word of God. Desire. Do you know how hungry a baby gets? you know how a baby acts when it gets hungry? Do you know that it'll put up a fuss until it gets what it wants? Now, God says you ought to have the desire in you like a little suckling child has, that that you're going to put up a fuss until you get the Word of God. He says, desire it. That means intently desire it. Crave it. You can't go on without it. Now, that's the desire He wants each one of us to have for the Word of God. Anyone who is not absorbed in the Word of God will never grow to spiritual maturity. Not growing to spiritual maturity in manhood, you will never be able to experience the freedom that you desire. Now, I keep saying these sobering things because I've lived with this deliverance ministry now for about 13 years. And I've found people that they want a snap of the finger thing and say, I've got 30 minutes time, Brother Frank. I just found out about a deliverance. Now, I came in and you minister deliverance and get me set free. And then I'll be through with that and forget it forever. Well, I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. It only works in conjunction with the spiritually matured life. The only way that you're going to walk in permanent strength and victory is to get serious about the disciplinary ways of the Lord. You're going to have to get serious about feeding consistently and fully on the Word of God. 
Paul went there to Corinth, as he tells about in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. And, and his heart was grieved. They had all the gifts and operations, as David has taught us, but they were coming behind in some things, and he wanted to really give them some meat of the Word of God. He said, I wanted to feed you on meat, but I couldn't because you were still carnal and you were still babies. If he'd given them the meat that he wanted to give them, they'd have gotten spiritual indigestion. They just couldn't handle it. They, they weren't mature enough to digest what he wanted to give them. So there is something for us to come to. Over in Hebrews, it talks about going on past certain doctrines, certain foundational doctrines. And my goodness, most of those foundational doctrines are still mysteries to the average Christian. And they hadn't begin to absorb those things, much less go on to the greater things of the revelations of God. But God wants us to grow and to develop until we have passed the milk stage of our spiritual intake where we can ingest the meat of God's Word and take on the strong things that God wants to feed us. Because we're going to have to develop in spiritual maturity. We're going to have to develop out of a condition of carnality. See, babies are carnal. All they think about is themselves. All they think about is what I need. Give me something, to, some milk to drink, and burp me, and change my diaper. Now, that's the way that little Christians are when they're baby Christians. They're just thinking about me. Come and do something for me, and come and minister to me. But when a person begins to mature, then they begin to minister to others. And God wants you to develop through the Word of God until you come to a maturity where you can get past the stage of just being fed a little milk and burp once in a while, where you can be of use in the kingdom of God to minister to others. Now, another one of the essential disciplines of the spiritual life is prayer. The spirit man has to stay in communication with his spiritual headquarters. Now, he has to stay in communication with God. He has to talk to God and he has to receive back from the Lord. You know, God will talk to you too. Some people still scratch their heads when somebody says, well, the Lord told me this or the Lord told me that. And they say, huh? <laughs> How does he know the Lord told him that? How did the Lord speak to him? Well, when you're walking in the Spirit, God talks to you. Hallelujah. And you talk with God, and there's a communication system going on. You know, it's said of Jesus that everything he did, he did in conjunction with the will of the Father. He never performed a miracle, gave a teaching, or anything else except it was of the Father. Now, how did Jesus always know what the Father's will was? Why, he just talked to him. That's why he prayed so much. You know, sometimes in order, in the busy ministry of Jesus, it said he and his disciples sometimes had no time, not even so much as to eat. Well, some of us are beginning to experience a little bit of that facet of Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> but the reason Jesus would sometimes get up a great while before day was so that he could be there alone and have an uninterrupted time of fellowship with the Father. And because he made that a priority in his life, he was able to stay in such fellowship and relationship with the Father that he would never do anything apart from the Father's will. The spiritual man is a man of prayer. If we are to expect to see the things of God wrought in our life, if we expect to see and experience and retain the deliverances that God has for us, I say again, we will not have them apart from spiritual discipline. We will not have them apart from a genuine prayer life. Now, the time to develop your prayer life is not in the moment of emergency. You know, well, you know, I'm going along all right and I don't need the Lord today, but here comes the emergency and the prayer lines want to go up in a hurry. But the time to develop a prayer life is just through the normal flow of our lives' activities as we build up a relationship with Him. You know, pastors want to have a great church. And I remember... I used to think, well, how can we have a great church, and how can we have a big church, and all the program and everything. And I'd watch the other churches, and I'd see them use methods and so on, and I'd try to copy their methods in order to have a successful church and a successful ministry. Well, it doesn't come that way. You know, there's a big church over in Korea, Pastor Cho's ministry over there, and they're reaching multiplied thousands and thousands of people in that ministry. And all over the world now, there are churches that are starting cell groups where they meet out in the homes and all of that, trying to duplicate what Pastor Cho is doing over there to have a great, successful, growing church. And Pastor Cho has been saying recently, he said, you've missed the main thing. You've missed the key to it. He says, over in Korea, we have a prayer mountain, and up on that mountain, there are caves. 
And there are people who go every day and stay in those caves. And they're intercessors and they're involved in prayer. He says the key to the growth of the ministry in Korea are not the organizations of the home meetings and those things, but the power comes from prayer. And there's no church, there's no ministry, there is no individual Christian who is going to progress and mature and be strong in the Lord apart from a very consistent prayer life. Another discipline that comes into our life that we may mature spiritually and be strong in the things of the Lord is the discipline of fasting. Now, there's a lot to be said about that, but I want to just touch on it as I'm mentioning a list of the spiritual disciplines that are necessary if you are to be free, if you are to stay free and walk in the liberty of the Lord. You know, Jesus didn't, he didn't say that it was optional, did he? In the Sermon on the Mount, when he was talking about giving and praying and fasting, he said, and when ye pray. He didn't, uh, and when ye fast. He didn't say, if you fast. You know, it, it, Jesus is saying there that he expected each one of his disciples to live a fasted life. There are spiritual benefits. Well, there's some even physical benefits that we know that come through regular fasting. But there are many spiritual benefits that come through the practice of fasting. As touching the ministry of deliverance, one day there were the disciples of Jesus, and they were unable to deliver a, a person that were brought, was brought to them. And when they asked Jesus about it, Jesus said, This kind cometh out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, what is he saying? He's saying there is something, there are some things which you are unable to perform spiritually apart from proper spiritual discipline. There are some things, no matter how much you want to see it done, no matter how much you want to participate in it, it will never be done apart from prayer and fasting. That is a spiritual principle. In fact, it's a good indicator of how serious one really is about his spiritual life and the things of God. Sometimes people come to me for ministry, usually the ministry of deliverance, sometimes for the ministry of healing, sometimes for counseling concerning problems that they have in their families and so forth. And you know, God has had me to begin to ask most of these people questions like this. Have you prayed about this? Have you fasted? Have you sought the Lord over it? How much do you really desire deliverance? Will you go and fast and pray for three days and then come back and let me minister to you? And it's amazing how many people do not have time to fast and pray to receive the blessings and the promises of God. But I found out I was spending too much of my time and too much of my energies with people that really didn't mean this with the Lord. And God has had me to make more demands upon those people that I minister to and say, look, if you really want to get set free, there are certain spiritual disciplines that you need to adhere to. When you show me that you mean business enough to where you'll go read Pigs in the Parlor and study it, and listen to some tapes, and spend a few days in fasting and prayer, then come back and let's see what God has. And it's amazing how much more gets done with those who meet those conditions as against those who walk in cold turkey without any preparation at all and say, I just want to be free. I just want to be set free from everything. I want to be totally delivered, but haven't paid any price of spiritual discipline to get that way. He makes demands that we're disciplined. The word discipline and the word Disciple all have the same root meaning. A disciple is a learner. He's one who follows, who's willing to be taught. He's teachable, and he's open to the things of the Lord. I tell you, it's a struggle sometimes to try to help people that are not teachable. They're not disciplined in understanding. They just want a quick solution to the things that they know that God has. Now, another thing that is important in spiritual discipline is meditation. In meditation. In Psalm 1... It gives a picture of a strong, mature believer. It pictures him like a tree. It says that he's like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. In other words, he has deep roots and he has a good, or good water supply source to where he can grow and where he can flourish. And it says that that tree is strong, that, it, that its leaf does not wither. When, when the hot winds blow, when trials and difficulties come against that tree... It doesn't wither and it doesn't fade. 
because it is rooted by that water and it's strong. And it says that that tree is a fruitful tree. This stalwart, strong, spiritual man is like a tree that bears his fruit in his season. When it comes time for that tree to produce fruit, you're going to find fruit on that tree. But the verse ahead of that gives you the key as to how this man becomes like a tree that is not moved by the storms of life, is not moved by the seasons of drought that may come by, but remains strong and green and alive and productive. It says that he meditates upon the law of God day and night. That means that the Word of God is continually in his heart. That Word of God is continually in his mind. And he is turning it over. He is thinking about it. He is meditating upon it. It's like a, a cow that brings up the cud and chews the cud after it's eaten, brings the food back up out of the stomach, the rumen, and begins to chew it over and over and over again to aid in digestion. And God wants us to do that with the Word of God, to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. We have to be disciplined in order to do that. There are so many things that press in that want to take our attention. There are so many things that want to occupy our mind's time. But if we really are intent upon God and we want to be people of God, we will not neglect the matter of meditating consistently day and night upon the Word of God. In the first chapter of Joshua, God is giving instructions to Joshua, who's just taken over the leadership from Moses and has been given the assignment to go in and drive out the enemies out of the land of Canaan and possess the inheritance. And so God is preparing Joshua to go in and possess the land. And he's telling Joshua, as you go forth into warfare, if you intend to be successful, here are the things that you must do. And the very first thing that God tells Joshua to do to have victory over physical enemies in Canaan land, is not to let the Word of God depart out of his mind. He is to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. You would have thought God would have said, Now, Joshua, the first thing is to get all the swords sharpened. The first thing is to get all the weapons in tip-top condition. But the first thing that God said to Joshua to win the battle was to stay in the Word of God, to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. I found an interesting word study in the Old Testament. One of the Hebrew words translated meditate comes from the word growl. And the lexicon says, like a lion growls over his prey. The lion has captured an antelope, and he has killed that antelope, and he's going to enjoy a feast of antelope. And he's not going to let any other creature bother him, this old king of the jungle. And so he growls over his prey to drive off every distraction and everything that would want to interfere with his time of enjoying his antelope dinner. He growls over it. And God said, that's the word for meditation. To where you get a hold of the Word of God and you're not going to let anything come in and divert you or distract you or take you away. You're going to enjoy your feast. In the Word of God. Meditating. Now, many of us need victory in battle like Joshua did. Many of us tonight need to go on and possess the spiritual inheritance that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. And he says the way that you prepare yourself for that battle, the way that you assure yourself that you will get victory over the devil, is to give time to the Word of God and meditate night and day upon the very Word of God. Now, there are other disciplines. Let's talk about the discipline of praise and worship. Now, that's a big subject. We just lump those two together. Praise and worship. As I was meditating upon that the other day, God says that praise and worship keeps the spirit man's heart in tune. Praise and worship is to the believer what tuning is to this piano or to the violin or to whatever other instrument has to be tuned. Without prayer and worship, the spirit man gets out of tune. And when he gets out of tune, all that can come out of him is discard. But when he has given himself to prayer and worship, his heart is in tune with the Lord. You know, a person 
who is a true spiritual man is a joyful man. Let me say that again. The spiritual man is a joyful man. And he's joyful because he's given himself to praise and to worship of God. You know, when you begin to give yourself in thanksgiving to God, do you know how good that makes you feel? You know, the praise and worship that we have in these services is not just a little time we spend to occupy some time before the preacher comes on. I go into meetings and they say, Brother, do you want us to cut the praise and worship time short so you'll have more time to teach? I say, don't you dare. And don't you dare. There's nothing any more part important than praising and worshiping the Lord. You follow the Spirit. If He says to praise and worship for two hours, praise and worship for two hours. Hallelujah. You're not going to waste time worshiping and praising the Lord. Because, you see, the man who praises the Lord becomes a worshipful man, and he becomes a joyful man. You know, you, you get joy by rejoicing when you rejoice. Some people say, well, I just don't find anything. Everything around me, you know, is going wrong. Everything around me is going bad. Everything around me is going sour. This has just been a bad day, and tomorrow's going to be another bad day. <clears throat> now, that person is not rejoicing when they're talking like that. And if that person is you, you're not rejoicing like that. And you're not the happy spiritual Christian that God wants you to be. But I want you to know there is always something to rejoice in. You can always rejoice in the Lord. That's what Paul said. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, I repeat, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. You can rejoice in the grace of God. Where would you be tonight without the grace of God? Where would you be without His mercy? Aren't you glad God is long-suffering and patient? Man, you deserve to be hit in the head with a two before a long time ago. But God put it off. I tell you, He's merciful to you. He's gracious to you. He's patient with you. Isn't it wonderful? All the merits of God. And there is always that opportunity to be thankful and expressive for the things of God. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. And when you start counting your blessings and you begin to see all that God has done, then your spirit begins to be lifted up and you begin to rejoice and you become a joyful Christian. So praise and worship <clears throat> brings us into a condition of joy. And we are joyful unto the Lord. Another discipline that is necessary in our spiritual lives to gain and maintain victory and come to spiritual maturity is the matter of spiritual fellowship. To where we are in fellowship, we are in unity, we are in one accord. Have you noticed how many times in the opening of the book of Acts where it says that they were together, they were in one place, and they were in one accord? Now, it's no accident that because of these things that so many, many mighty miracles of, the, of God took place after it tells us that they were in unity and that they were in one accord. So the true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will find his place. He will be set and he will be functioning in the body of Christ. Let me say that again. That is so very important. Every believer who is really going to be strong in the ways of the Lord will not be detached from the body of Christ, but he will be connected to the body of Christ. He will be set in his place in the body of Christ. He is a member in particular of the body of Christ. God has designed each one of you <coughs> to fit in <coughs> excuse me, as a functioning member in the body of Christ. You need to know where that place is and to be set in that place and to be functioning in that place in the body of Christ. <coughs> I cannot find any place in the Word of God where it talks about a part-time Christian. I cannot find any place in the body of Christ, in the, in the Word of God, where it says that we are to be part-time members in the body of Christ. When the body of Christ comes together to function, the Word of God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The true believer who wants to be strong in the Lord will be identified and functioning in the body of Christ. That is imperative. That is absolutely essential. God gives no place for the Lone Ranger to be out yonder doing his own thing. God has created us where we will be together. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives the emphasis upon the body of Christ and how that it says that no one member can say of another, I have no need of you. I can make it on my own. Neither can he turn it around and say, I don't need you as well as you don't need me. So 
We do need one another in the body of Christ, and that's the only way that we can function. The spirit man, the spiritual man, must be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely essential. In the book of Acts, it keeps talking about being filled with the Spirit. Now, this was after people were baptized in the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts. And it's interesting just to go through the book of Acts and begin to make note of the times where it talks about those who were filled with the Spirit and to read in the context those things that took place in order that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's look in um, Acts for just a moment at a few illustrations of this. I want you to see that as people are filled with the Holy Spirit, what preceded that filling. In the first chapter of Acts, verse 14, we read, And these all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, haven't we just learned and observed that prayer is one of the spiritual disciplines? Okay, so they were in prayer as they met together. In the second chapter of Acts, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There again, they were all gathered together. There weren't any absent members of the body of Christ. They were all there together. And the celebration of Pentecost was a time of great praise. It was a time of great thanksgiving. It was a time of prayer. So they were continuing. They were set in the body of Christ. They were in operation. They were in praise. They were in worship. All of those things were taking place. Then is it any wonder that we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah! Can you see the principle that they were giving themselves to spiritual discipline when the anointing and the power of God's Holy Spirit fell upon them? Then you go on to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding unto the church. They were praising. We saw that praise was one of the disciplines of our spiritual life. And so we go on to read in the context of chapter 4 and verse 8. And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, he got up and preached an anointed message under the power of God's Holy Spirit, because Peter was one of those who was giving himself to the processes of spiritual discipline. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, And when they had prayed, now here's another spiritual discipline, they were in prayer again. The place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. I believe it's eight or ten times in the book of Acts there is reference to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And if we would trace all of those out, we would find the same identical pattern, that they were filled and anointed and empowered and glorified God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because they were giving themselves to the necessary spiritual disciplines. So praise the Lord. I pray that we have seen the truth of what God's trying to say to us in that regard. Now, let us look a little bit further tonight, and I want to spell something out to you as we come to deal with the enemies of the spiritual man. It is my firm conviction that no demon spirit can indwell the spirit of a born-again believer because he is indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God has come in to this person and he is as a temple. And when God came into the temple, he came into the Holy of Holies. And the spirit of a man corresponds to the Holy of Holies. And there is no evil spirit. When Jesus cleansed the temple, and there were those things that defiled, the money changers, the birds, the cattle, and all of that, they were not behind the veil of the temple in the Holy of Holies, where the presence and Shekinah glory of God dwell. But those creatures were in the outer courts of the temple. And so it is in our life. We're not dealing with demon spirits that indwell the human spirit, but we're dealing with evil spirits that are in the outer areas of our life. They're in our soulish nature, and they're in our physical bodies is where we're dealing with the devil in our life. Now, the devil knows that he can't get in to the spirit man, but he knows that when your spirit man is in full tilt operation, walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, obeying the spirit, not quenching the spirit, not grieving the spirit, that he's in trouble. 
So he's going to do everything he can to stifle the operation of your spirit man. Now, how is he going to do that? He's going to attack the soulish man. And as he attacks the soulish man, then he can keep the spirit man from functioning. As he attacks the physical man, have you found out that when your body's in pain, that it's real difficult for you to hear God? It's difficult for you to be spiritual if lusts are stirred up in your flesh. And so the devil knows that, and he will work against the soulish man, and he'll work against the physical body in order to divert the operation of the spirit man. Now, we're going to talk about a few other things that the enemy brings in to try to stifle and quench the operation of your spirit man. One of the favorite tricks of the devil to stifle the spirit man is to cause people to become religious. If he can get people to be religious, that becomes the substitute for the function of the spiritual man. Every person who is religious is controlled by evil spirits. Now, I'm talking about a difference between being religious and being spiritual. The spiritual man is spirit. The spiritual man is led of the spirit. The spiritual man worships God in spirit and in truth or reality. But the religious man can worship God soulishly. He can worship God physically without his spirit man or the Holy Spirit being involved in anything that he's doing. He is just doing a religious exercise, and the exercise of religion takes the place of the life of the Spirit. Now, when we come together to worship God, we have to be energized, led, and directed by the Holy Spirit. We have to submit, say, Holy Spirit, what do you want today? How many songs do you want sung? Which hymns do you want sung? And he will come forth. There needs to be a place for the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of utterance, of prophecy, of tongues, of interpretations, and for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Now, if we become religious, we set up a formula. And we say, well, Lord, here's what we're going to do. Now, we just invite you to bless it. And there's not much of a crack for the Lord to get in there to do anything. Now, the Spirit needs to have freedom so that we can come together and we can worship God in spirit and in truth. The devil will come in to try to make people religious by adhering to religious tradition. Well, why do you do it this way when you come together at church? Well, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way our parents did it. This is the way our grandparents did it. This is the way it's been done for generations. It must be right because it's having been done so long. Now, this is the thing that Jesus ran into when he came here on earth, and he found people bound in religious traditions. And he said, you have made the law of God of none effect by your traditions. You see, religious formalism. I was ministering to a woman one day. She happened to have been of a Lutheran background. She could just have well been Presbyterian or anything else. But a demon manifested in her, and it claimed to be a spirit of Lutheran formalism. And its boast was, I keep the Holy Spirit from moving. Well, religious formalism will do that. It will stifle the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit must have an atmosphere of freedom in order to move in. The same thing is true of religious ritualism. It is a stifler of the operation of the Holy Spirit. But many people think that they have done their duty to God if they go into a service sit in a pew, look at the back of somebody's neck, and go through a ritual form of worship. They can go through that, and the Spirit of God may not have touched them at one single point or one single moment in that entire service. The objective of the devil to stifle the spirit man, again I say, is to cause people just to act religious. The spirit of religious display. Now, so much we learn about the religious spirits is from the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees were very pious, and they were very religious. You read, for example, the 23rd chapter of Matthew, and it gives you a whole lot of things. It says that Jesus brought forth concerning the religious or religiosity of the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, woe unto them. That word woe can be translated with the word curse. Cursed be those that worship just out of a religious way rather than out of the Spirit of God. You know, they did this for religious display. They did this to be seen of men. 
Jesus said they may stand on the street corner, you know, where they got the benefit of traffic coming from at least four directions, where they'll have a good audience. And they stand on the street corner there and they pray and they lift up pious prayers unto the Lord. And God says they have their reward. They've got all they're going to get. The attention of man. That's what they were looking for. They get no reward of God. He says that some people, when they fast, he said they want to be sure that everybody else knows about it. And so they go around and they look as hungry as they can. So they'll get some sympathy. And then somebody will say, oh, you must not have eaten today. Oh, I'll bet you're fasting. And see, they do it to be seen of men. And it says they have their reward. They have all they're going to get. He says some people, when they put in their offering, they send the trumpeter ahead and blow the trumpet and say, everybody look this way now. I'm about to do something religious. I'm about to give an offering. He says the person who does that has no reward with God. He got all the reward he's going to get when he got the reward of other men seeing what he has been done. In too many of our services where we go to minister, there is religious display. People who just put on a religious show just to be seen of men. I know I was in a service not long ago and some of us were dancing a little bit unto the Lord. And there was one lady who stepped out and she was a quite portly lady. And she, she did a whirling dervish thing around the room. And she knocked over three people in five chairs. Now, you know, she went over and sat down like, boy, did I ever show them how to dance unto the Lord. All she had done was put on a religious demonstration. It was in the flesh, and it may have been even demonic. I've seen some of it that actually is demonic. Then another thing that the devil promotes is religious idolatry and religious artifacts, substituting things in place of true spiritual worship. I think most of you have gotten away from religious ornamentation, the wearing of certain religious jewelry on your body to let other people know how religious you are. God doesn't judge you by outward appearance, but He judges you by your heart. The Word of God says don't dress up the outside. That's not what impresses God, and that's not going to impress anybody else spiritually. But adorn the hidden man of the heart. God looks on the inward part, and God sees the hidden man. Then another thing that the devil promotes is religious pride. As we find again in the Pharisees with their Pharisaic legalism. You know, they felt that they were so much better than everybody else because they did things much more religiously than other people did them. As the, Pharise as the Pharisee was praying one day and he said, I'm so glad I'm not like that old sinner over yonder. Oh, that poor guy over there. Well, I fast and I give tithes and I do all these religious things. But God said it was that sinner over there that was beating on his chest and repenting and asking God to have mercy on him and forgive him, they went down to his house justified. But that self-righteous man, he didn't receive any recognition for his religious activity. See, I'm talking about the things that are the enemy of the spiritual man. Religious activity, religious hypocrisy, where you live a dip double standard. You act one way at church and another way as soon as you get home. You act like some pious little saint sitting up there with a halo on your head, and when you get home you speak ugly to your wife and your children. That's religious hypocrisy. Then there are all kinds of spirits of religious deception. There are doctrinal deceptions. There are false doctrines. And we could talk on and on about many false doctrines that are being promulgated even in our own day and time. There are the imbalances of doctrines. You know, you can take any doctrine and you can just push it out of bounds. There was a time I got involved in doctrines like uh, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God and predestination, and I actually got more Calvinistic than Calvin himself. You know, I mean, you can take any good thing and you can just push it and push it and push it till it gets far out. Now, I believe wholeheartedly that one of the things that God is doing today is bringing forth a message of faith to the body of Christ. I believe in the importance of faith. I know that it's impossible to please God without faith. But you can get on faith and you can ride that thing and ride that thing and ride that thing until you've gotten way out yonder in the wilderness with it, son. We have been having to cast demons of faith only out of some people that they have come so absorbed in faith that faith is the one total answer to everything in the spiritual life. And God knows that the devil does that to push us out of bounds so that we will neglect the whole counsel of God. You can't, you can't neglect the matter of obedience. You've got to trust and obey. 
That's the counterpart. That's the other side of the coin of faith. And some people think that you can have faith and achieve anything of faith without even having to do what God tells you to do. And a lot of people are struggling and falling on their faces trying to believe God for things, but on the other hand, they're not doing what God told them to do. We have to have a balanced doctrine. And the devil is trying to get people unbalanced in their doctrines so that he can get them diverted and defeat them in their spiritual life. Then there are all kinds of questions, all kinds of doctrinal questions that come up. You know, sometimes we go and we have question and answer sessions, and we let people ask questions. And it sure is revealing with some people and the questions they ask. You can tell that they're on dead center with some of the questions that they're answering, asking. You know, where did Cain get his wife? Or some foolish thing like that, you know. And they can't go on with the Lord because they can't get an answer to that question. They've asked all the learned theologians and they've got this theory and that opinion and this thing and the other. And they're so confused and they're so mixed up. And they've just determined, I can't be a Christian and I can't go on with the Lord and I can't do anything till I get this question resolved. And all it's doing, the devil's raised some old question, thorny question in their life just to get them sidetracked and get them locked in so they can't go on with the main business of growing in the Lord and serving the Lord. Well, there are spirits of deception that cause people to become self-righteous and feel like they're the only ones that's right. There, there are false teachings that come forth that people become defenders of the faith. You know, defending their doctrine. You know, here's my doctrine. All right, so they lift up their doctrine and somebody takes a swipe at it. You know, they're trying to knock their doctrine down. So they have to prop up their doctrine. And so they get all locked in. They're all they're consumed with, this is my doctrine. I'm going to defend that doctrine. I'm going to keep that doctrine. Nobody's going to change that doctrine. And there are forces at work in the body of Christ right now causing division and strife and confusion throughout the body just trying to uphold some kind of a doctrine that they want to uphold and prove that they're right. And that's only the work of the devil to bring strife and division and confusion into the body of Christ. That's all it's about. It's all that it's about. You know, I was ministering to one fellow one day, and he was all in this doctrinal obsession thing, you know. And the demon came out of him, and as he came out, that demon said, If I go, who will defend the faith? He was a defender of the faith spirit. And I, you've seen some people that's got one of those. Now, a few more things I must mention. Things that hinder the operation of the spirit man. Guilt and condemnation. You know, the devil wants to rob you of the understanding of what Jesus accomplished for you on Calvary. He wants to rob you of an understanding of the grace of God. When God saved you, He forgave you. Your sins were erased. God doesn't remember your sins, your past sins, when after He's forgiven you. You won't face those things in judgment because God has covered them with His atoning blood. Whoever confesses his sins, repents of his sin. The Lord has promised to forgive that person and even to cleanse him from all of his unrighteousness. See, we are accepted by God not because of our good works, but because of God's good work. Not because of our man-made accumulated righteousness, but because of the righteousness that was bought for us on Calvary. And so when we are saved, we are forgiven and we are cleansed of our sin. But the devil wants to come along and drag up all of the skeletons out of the past. He wants to dig up the graveyard and bring it past you and say, remember what you did. Do you think God would ever forgive you? Do you think God could ever use you in service after those things that you did back there? Well, you know, that's what the whole church is about. The whole church is just a body of redeemed sinners. Glory to God. We've been redeemed and we've been covered by the blood of Jesus. Sometimes the devil gets us to look and say, well, he committed that sin. I never did do that one. Now, that makes me more righteous than he then. No, all of us were unrighteous. All of us were dead in our trespasses and sin. And we're all in the same boat together. I don't care what sin he committed or what sin I committed. It took the blood of Jesus to atone for every one of them. Now, when God forgives you, accept that forgiveness. The condemnation that keeps rising up and the guilt over past sins that you've repented of and confessed and received God's forgiveness from, when those things are paraded back from you, that's not God presenting them to you. That's the devil presenting them to you. He wants to defeat your spirit man. He knows that if he can make you feel guilty, make you feel condemned, make you feel unworthy to be a follower of the Lord and be in the company of God, then you can be hindered and blocked from serving the Lord and moving as a spiritual man. There are some of you in this service tonight who desperately need, in a few moments you'll have the opportunity to be set free from guilt 
and condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit, no, walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, no condemnation. You can have a clear conscience. Some of you have defiled conscience. Your conscience just tears you up. It just eats you alive. If God forgave you, forgive yourself and live as a forgiven person. Now, another thing that the devil does is to bring fear, religious fear. If he can give you, give you religious fear, he can knock you off the pedestal from serving God as a spiritual man. Oh, I lost my salvation. The fear of lost salvation. The fear of God's judgment. The fear of the second coming of the Lord. The fear that the church is going to be caught up and you're going to miss it. You know, this is taught in some places. Suppose the Lord comes on Friday and you weren't in service on Wednesday. Sorry, you blew it. No matter how you live prior to that, you may, I mean, it's, it's got to... And that ministers fear. A lot of religious fears are being taught. Some people have a fear of what I call ultimate rejection. That, you know, they serve the Lord, they love the Lord, they're faithful to the Lord, but they have this haunting fear that's going to be like they read over there in Matthew where Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount and He said there's going to come the day when those are going to stand before me and they say, well, Lord, we've prophesied and cast out devils and done many wonderful works and the Lord's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. And there's a lot of people that have that old religious fear devil on them of ultimate rejection. That after they've lived a good faithful life all the years for the Lord, that God's going to say to them, I never did know you. Sorry, but the gates are shut against you. You can't get in. Now, another one of those spirits that the devil tries to take people off to divert the spirit man is that old spirit of independence. The Lone Ranger spirit where they're not submitted to spiritual authority and not submitted to spiritual leadership. You may know of examples where that teaching has been put out of balance, where it's been perverted, where it's been abused, but it's still in the Word of God. God's Word is not imbalanced, and God's Word is not unfair. Not unfair. God's Word does not bring people into bondage. God's Word does not advocate one person controlling another person. But it says there is a place for submission. It says in the 13th chapter of Hebrews that we are to submit to those who have the rule over us. Talking about our pastors and our spiritual leaders, for they watch for your souls. They watch out for you. They are spiritual guardians over your life. But there are some that want to be spiritually independent. They want to be lone rangers, but even lone ranger had Tonto. Glory to God. <clears throat> not joined into the body of Christ, not committed and not functioning in that body. Then there's another whole spectrum that we will not have time to get into, only to mention. And those are the areas which I call spiritual adultery, where the devil can get Christians drawn in to counterfeit supernaturalism. And many Christians today are coming out uh, of that forest where they have, have been lost for so long, looking for something real, looking for something genuine, being attracted with a curiosity about the satanic supernatural getting drawn into all facets of occultism, getting drawn into all kinds of strange cult groups, getting drawn into various degrees and facets of Eastern religions and false bloodless religions and things like that. Now, these things introduce a direct spiritual poison into the life of a believer. These things are abominations unto the Lord. They are acts of spiritual unfaithfulness. God calls it spiritual harlotry and spiritual adultery when you go outside of Him to dabble into the realm of the satanic kingdom. And people who have dabbled in those areas invariably have the curses that go along with them. They have the curses in their physical bodies and they have the curses in their minds and they have the curses in their hindrances to the flowing and moving in the things of the Spirit of God. God wants us to be spiritual men and to function as spiritual men, controlled by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being uh, alive in the things of the Spirit of God. How many of you want that for your life? That's your goal. That's your desire, to be that kind of a spiritual person. Well, here's what we've got to do. We've got to kick out the devil. Wherever he's got in and brought that hindrance against the spiritual man, then we have to discipline the spirit man. You can't have your cake and eat it too. 
If you've had deliverance, you still have to discipline the spiritual man and lead him through those things that we've shown you. So God wants to, to, to deliver you, body, soul, and spirit, from the oppressions that would come against you. Well, you feel equal to a little ministry tonight? Hallelujah. Let's take another step in that direction. Let's be free from many of these things that we've talked about and whatever else the Lord will show us. Let us stand, relax. Let's go through a confession and a prayer. Set the stage and receive our help and our deliverance in the Lord tonight. Let's make this confession and this prayer unto the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ you, are you are my Lord and you are my King. You have redeemed me and established me in yourself. I am born of the Spirit of God. I am empowered of the Spirit of God. I desire to live for you and to serve you and to glorify you. I stand against every hindrance to my spiritual man. I'm out of agreement with Satan and all his works. I do not want him and I do not need him. I take back everything I ever yielded to him. And I give myself fully to you. I purpose to glorify you in each word I speak, in everything I do, in my body, in my soul, and from my spirit. I'm calling upon you tonight in all sincerity of heart and with faith in your promise that you will set me free. Lord, deliver me and set me free that I may serve you and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I encourage every one of you to enter in we do have power and authority over every unclean, unclean spirit that has come to indwell you that it must leave tonight in the name of Jesus. How much deliverance you get in a session like this depends upon your participation and your cooperation with what we do. I remind each one of you that it is not I alone that has the spiritual authority to deal with evil spirits. They that believe in Jesus, the signs will follow and you'll cast out demons, not only out of others, but you can cast demons out of yourself. Right here in this service tonight, you don't have to wait for me to call out any particular demon for you to be free from it. You can exercise your faith, your spiritual authority, and you can speak to it. You don't have to go away from this service, as I've seen some go away. They say, well, Brother Frank never did call for that demon that I had. The anointing of deliverance is in this meeting tonight, and you can have as much as you want. You are a spiritual warrior. You are in spiritual battle. Don't become passive, but become strong. The Scripture says, Stand. Stand against the wiles of the devil. The Scripture says to wrestle against those principalities and powers. The Scripture says that we have weapons that are to be employed. We have to be actively involved in the ministry of deliverance. We have to be actively involved in spiritual battle to be set free. We have got joined into battle tonight. We're the army of God, and we're fighting for our lives, and we're fighting to serve God and to glorify Him with our total being. Glory to God. Enter in. Enter in. Every demon I call for, assume that you've got it. And stand against it in the name of Jesus. If it's not in you, it won't come out of you. So don't be afraid to challenge it. Don't be afraid something's going to come out that's not in you. It's better to challenge something that's not in you than to leave unchallenged something that is in you. So challenge it all. I was ministering this one time and told a fellow that in the group meeting. He came up afterward and he said, Brother Frank, you were right. He said, I had one of everything that you mentioned except one thing. And I said, what was that? He said, you called for female infirmities, and I didn't have that one. <laughs> but I had all the rest. One man said, well, I participated in that. I didn't know I had that spirit, but when you called it out, I expected it to come out of me, and it did. He said, I didn't know that thing was there. Well, that'll be true with some of you tonight. Some will come out, and you didn't even know it was there. That thing was hidden, and it deceived you and covered itself up. Praise the Lord. You love Jesus? Any wonderful deliverer? So many of you have already received large doses of deliverance. Some of you may be in the service for the first time during this conference, but you just enter right in and God has a blessing. Know that that spirit will come out as a breath. If he wants to manifest itself, don't be direct, dis 
distracted by any kind of manifestation, but just press on, just press on in the battle. You know, we've seen people taken over, by, as I say, by the power of evil spirits, thrown in the floor and, 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 and lose control of their voice and their bodies. But you know, we found that when those persons will exercise the spiritual authority that they have in the Lord to resist those devils, speak to those devils, command those devils, and command to breathe those spirits out, that those deliverances will take place and they don't have to go through all of that orgy on the floor. Hallelujah. It's good to see the work of the God know how to cooperate with God's Holy Spirit. I'm saying I want you to exercise your spiritual authority tonight. Let's get into all this bunch of old religious devils. Most of us have come out of religious backgrounds. I had to be delivered from all of my old baptistic spirits. There was a group of us, about eight preachers one day, and we sat in a circle, and we delivered each other of all of our denominational spirits. Glory to God. So you get rid of yours tonight. In the name of Jesus, I stand against, with the people of God, every religious spirit that hinders the operation of God's Holy Spirit. We have renounced you. We deny you any further place and work in our lives. You spirits of religious hindrance, you spirits of religiosity, you spirits of religious tradition, begin to come on out. In the name of Jesus, religious tradition, religious tradition, religious ritualism, religious formalism, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you religious devils, you religious devils that would rob, you would hinder the operation of the spirit man. You old devils of false religious worship, false religious worship, I command you to go in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus, I command you to go in the name of Jesus, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. You will not rob us of our spiritual position, you will not rob us of our spiritual blessing, you will not cause us to miss the rewards of God. In the name of Jesus, I command you religious spirits. You religious spirits, you denominational spirits, all of the Baptistic spirits and Presbyterian and Methodist spirits, in the name of Jesus, sectarianism, sectarianism, all denominational pride spirits, denominational pride, I command you to go. Your pride spirit says we're the only one that has the truth. We're the only ones that are serving God. We're the only ones that God loves. In the name of Jesus, the spirits of religious pride. Religious pride and sectarian pride, I command you to go in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. All you old charismatic pride spirits, I command you to go. All of you Pentecostal pride spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. All of you old devils of pride say, I speak in tongues, and everybody that doesn't is substandard and God doesn't love them, probably not even saved. I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, all spirits of religious pride and religious bigotry, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on down. Behold the pride in those church buildings and those nice cushioned pews. I command you to go. All your religious spirits that were just associated with material church buildings, I command you to go. And pride and arrogance about those church buildings. I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. All of you devils that have put people in bondage to religious programming. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. That's right. Demons of religious programming. Religious formal formulas in the name of Jesus. I command you to leave us now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. You keep coming out of us right now. All the spirits of religious display to be seen of men. The spirits of the scribes and Pharisees. The spirits of the scribes and the Pharisees. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Religious display. Religious display. In the name of Jesus. All of you spirits of religious interruption. Interruption. And religious display. We command you to go. You go from God's people. Hallelujah. In deliverance wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for setting every captive free, that we can be free in our spirit, man, to love and to serve the living God. In the name of Jesus, all spirits of religious idolatry, all spirits of religious idolatry. That's right. The idolatry of buildings. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. The idolatry towards ministers, 
I command you to go. The idolatry of I prefer Peter, or I prefer Paul, or I prefer Cephas, or I prefer Pastor Johnson, or I prefer Pastor Smith, in the name of Jesus, you spirits of idolatry, men idolatry, religious idolatry, of certain men, of certain men, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God says all are yours. All are yours. In the name of Jesus, you will continue to leave. You will continue to leave now in the power of Jesus' name. Keep going. Keep going. Religious idolatry associated with religious artifacts. I command you to go. Every demon that has come because one of us has possessed a so-called picture of Jesus, I command you to go. That is a false Christ, and that is another Jesus. It's not the true Jesus. All spirits of religious idolatry that come in through images and pictures, I command you to go. God forbids us to have any likeness of anything regarding deity of the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. We're not to have any, any imagery pertaining to the Godhead. And I command every demon, if you've had those things, repent of them, destroy them as soon as you get home. They'll attract demons into your house. They'll attack, they are, they are an abomination to God. They are religious idols. In the name of Jesus, destroy all of those religious artifacts. In the name of Jesus, the crucifixes and the crosses and the doves and all of those things we want to wear on that person. Get rid of them. They're religious idolatry. They're demonic. They're an abomination unto the Lord. They're religious spirits. Religious spirits associated with those things. In the name of Jesus, we command them to go. God's people are delivered. You spirits of religious idolatry, I break your yoke, I break your chains of ignorance and darkness, and I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. You will go now. Those of you who have been in Roman Catholicism, you may have many artifacts, because that church has many, many artifacts. The rosary beads and all the paraphernalia, the incense and the candles and the imagery, imagery of saints and all of that. In the name of Jesus, it's religious trapping. And it has no power. It has no right. It has no approval of God. It's disapproved of God. And we command everyone to be set free from the oppression that came in from religious idolatry. In the name of Jesus, you must go. You must go now. Continue to leave us. Continue to leave us. Stand against them, people. Breathe them out. Stand against them. You know some of you have had those things in your life. It may be new truths to you, but you'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we command you to go. We command you to go. Every spirit of religious error, spiritual error, false doctrine, false doctrine, imbalanced doctrine, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Spirits of false doctrine, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. You old defender of the faith spirit, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you go now. We are free in the power of Jesus' name. All of you spirits that are associated with the cults and with the occults, we command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of fortune-telling, every spirit of fortune-telling, we command you to go. Spirits of divination, spirits of levitation, spirits of incantation, spirits associated with demonic music, spirits of rock music, I command you to go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every spirit associated with demonic music, you must leave this night in the name of the Lord. You must leave this night in the name of the Lord. By the stripes of Jesus, we are liberated, we are set free. Many of you need to be freed tonight from that spirit of guilt and condemnation and unworthiness. Some of you, the devil's persuaded, persuaded you you've committed the unpardonable sin. And we speak to those spirits of condemnation. That's right, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I speak to you spirits of guilt, of condemnation, of unworthiness. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.